There we go. All right, so we've got everything happening behind the scenes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that little delay. Um, I'm Meredith, and as Sarah said, I work for the um, Nelson Provincial Museum, and I also work for a virtual reality 360-degree photography company in Nelson as well. Um, the little tour program said I was going to be talking about making 3D models of collection objects. I am. I'm also talking about some other stuff as well, so you're going to get more than you bargained for today. So today I'm going to do just a quick re uh, orientation of where Nelson Provincial Museum is, a uh, potted history of the murders. Uh, there's lots of people in here. I guess you've got as twisted and gory a uh, sense of history as me. You won't be disappointed with the story. And then the things that the museum staff did uh, around the content. And unlike Gareth from Auckland Museum, who's got how many? Six staff uh, focused on digital technologies. We've got zero. So we did this all ourselves. Uh, learning as we went. Um, so we did 3D modeling and 360 degree tours and then I'll just talk about a little bit of what we learned along the way. So Nelson Provincial Museum is in the center of Nelson. Um, it's a fairly big museum um, for its size. Um, I picked some dark and spooky moody pictures to get you in the mood. Um, we've got a team of 13 full-time equivalent staff and we are spread out over three sites. We've got the museum in Central Nelson, an off-site storage warehouse and research facility where staff work, and then further south, another 20 minutes, a uh, workshop and um, big off-site store where the technicians work. So not very many people, and we're well spread out, so we don't see each other very often. Um, our collecting area is that yellow circle. It's the Nelson-Tasman region, the top of the South Island. And if you can see that red dot there, that is where the Mangatapu murders happen. So bear with me while I do a little bit of storytelling. So 1866 is 150 years ago this year. And the murders happened on the Mangatapu track, which is a large walking track that runs between Canvas Town in the Marlborough Sounds and Nelson. It's a good full day's walk. Um, it was very well used in 1866. Um, it traversed by lots of people. The South Island at that time was uh, full of gold mining. The Otago gold fields were open, the West Coast was all gold mines, and over on the East Coast was gold as well. Um, that brought a lot of transient people, a lot of gold miners looking for their future, um, publicans, storekeepers, and it also brought some bandits. And let's meet some bandits, shall we? Right, take a good look at these four gentlemen because we're going to be meeting them in a different um, way later on. Um, these four guys, they're known as the Burgess Gang. Um, they all came from London, though Joseph Sullivan on the end was actually an Irishman, but he was a prize fighter in London. Three of the men, Richard Burgess, who was the gang leader, Thomas Kelly and Joseph Sullivan, were convicts and sent on convict ships to Australia and made their way to New Zealand, where they caused a hang of a lot of havoc. Um, Philip Levy, though, was a bit less rough. He was actually a gold trader and a merchant, and he acted as the gang's um, off-seller of the stolen goods. Um, the two guys, Richard Burgess and Thomas Kelly, um, had known each other for six years down in Otago. They'd worked as a tight, tight unit. Um, they were also um, used Philip Levy's services for quite some time. In 1866, the three of them moved up to Hokitika on the west coast, where they met up with uh, Joseph Sullivan, who just recently arrived in the country, and they formed a gang of four. And they set about um, going across to Canvas Town to see what havoc they could cause there because they were wanted on the west coast for God knows what. Um, Canvas Town. Don't know if any of you have been there. Um, it's pretty small today, and as the name suggests in 1866, uh, it wasn't much to write home about. Um, in Canvas Town, uh, there was a French gentleman called Felix Mathieu um, with a lovely little goatee, and um, he owned the very optimistically named uh, pub called Café du Paris in Canvas Town, bless him. Um, and it was in the Café du Paris that Philip Levy went with his ears open to see if he could see who had money in the town. Unfortunately for Felix, that evening he announced to everyone that he was leaving the Café du Paris, he was selling up shop and heading over in a few days' time over the Mangatapu track um, with all his belongings along with two other storekeepers and a gold miner with all their stuff across the Mangatapu track 
and Philip Levy, with his ears wagging, ran back to the other three who were hiding in a disused farmhouse, and they formed a plan to head up the Mangatapa track and ambush these four, which they did. Um, on June 12th, the team went up early. They hid behind a big rock, and as the four came with all of their goods and a pack horse, they jumped out and they tied them up. They robbed them, and they then proceeded to kill them in um, any way you could imagine with a gun, a knife, a fist, and a rock. Um, after all of that bloody work was done, they hid the bodies in the bush and headed down to Nelson with their spoils. When they got to Nelson, they made a bit of a scene of themselves. Uh, they went shopping and bought beautiful, fancy uh, velvet coats and waistcoats for themselves, um, went drinking, and when it became apparent that people were missing, uh, these four were quickly rounded up and arrested. Um, it was a long, drawn-out trial in Nelson. Uh, Richard Burgess, who was a very charismatic character, represented himself in court. All the words were recorded word for word in the newspaper, which is fantastic to read on Papers Past. I'd recommend it. Um, Richard Burgess also wrote his uh, memoirs while in prison. And I've got to admit, I've got a bit of a historical bad boy crush on him. He's very well spoken. Um, he, Sullivan turned Queen's evidence, and he dobbed the other three in. That was the Irish guy. So he protected himself. And um, the other three were sentenced to death by hanging. Uh, special gallows were made. And in October 66, the three men were executed um, by hanging. Uh, Joseph Sullivan had to leave the country as part of his plea bargain. He had to get to Australia. No ship would take him because they were well recognized. Um, these portraits were all over the media. Everyone knew what they looked like. So the New Zealand police came up with a clever ploy to disguise Joseph Sullivan as a policeman in which he was dressed in full policeman's uniform and escaped, um, well, or, and was transported to Australia unrecognized uh, in, with a flax mustache which um, I believe is probably what did it. So that's not quite the end of the story, because what happened after the executions were the three men were cut down, and there was a big story um, or a big debate in the scientific community at the time as to whether hanging was, death by hanging was caused by strangulation or by severing of the spinal column. This was a very important question. And many learned doctors were gathered after the executions, not just these two, they were about five or six, and they performed <laughs> autopsies on the bodies, and they discovered that they were, um, death was caused by strangulation. Now, in the process of the autopsies, the three uh, convicts' heads were severed and decapitated. And um, later on that day, the local dentist, Dr. Tatton, took possession of a sack of said heads, which he then proceeded to shave very carefully and make plaster casts of. Now, they sent them to the dentist because it makes sense. He was used to making plastic casts of teeth. He knew what he was doing. And the reason that they wanted to have these plastic casts was because at the time in the 1860s, phrenology was a really hot topic. Uh, apparently, you could know a lot about a person's personality and where they were going in life by carefully feeling the lumps and bumps in their heads. So these three heads of these very, very wicked men were well sought after and everyone wanted to have a touch. So it was with these three heads, and the museum has got uh, three of these plastic cast heads, the original ones, um, that we started our first digital exploration into the topic. Um, we decided we were going to make 3D models of the death casts, and we started with a trial with sheep skulls. Um, we took multiple photographs of a sheep skull, um, put it into software. This was PhotoScan, which we didn't end up using in the end and ended up with a really beautiful model of a sheep skull that you could rotate on the screen and look in great detail. So it was proof of concept. We decided we would do it with the heads. Um, I spent a whole day with our museum photographer photographing the heads in great intimate detail, each angle, so I know them very well now. Um, we fed that photographic data into um, these programs. They're all freeware except for Cinema 4D. Um, and we ended up with this. And now this is where I have to get out of here. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, wrong one. Sorry, guys. Oh, God, got a preview. Where is it gone? Here we go. All righty. So 
So we've got these, this file at the moment in the exhibition running on a big screen, on a projection screen in the exhibition. But the files themselves of each of the heads are um, fully rotatable, so you could look at them on a touch screen and, and spin them all around. All right, we'll get rid of those ugly mugs. OK. Here you come. That's that. Right, the next thing we did. Oh, yeah, we'd hoped to create 3D models of the heads um, because the dentist did that 150 years ago. He made multiple casts, and we thought it would be quite fun to actually print a bunch of heads as an experiment, but it was too expensive, so we just went analog instead with the cast making. <laughs> That's the, the boss's husband. Bless him. <laughs> Right, the next um, thing that we uh, chose to do was make a 360-degree photograph of the place where the murders happened at Murderer's Rock, and I'll show you this in a bit. So we've got a touch screen in the gallery of this. And then um, my, other, my other hat is uh, we went and did a 360-degree photographic tour of the exhibition space itself once it was opened um, as an experiment to see what it was like. So we did a trial shoot that's um, Marcus, my business partner, doing a trial shoot to see where was the best place to place cameras and get the, um, the sphere photography. We did a high resolution shoot through those photographs into the software, then added content that was already existing from the museum's exhibition, like label texts and photos and things. And we thought it would be a fairly easy, easy thing to do. And then we created, which one was it? That one, okay. So here is, oh my god, what's the time? Here is, just so I'll just spin around, this is the exhibition space. That's the way out, that video. So we just uh, chucked, a, chucked a video on there so people don't feel like they're um, missing out. Um, and we threw in extra data and content so we can zoom in on cases. And close up photography. So this tour is not finished, not finished yet. I was sort of rushing around to get it done. I thought, oh, you guys will understand. Um, let's go outside. I'll take you to where the touch screen is, and we can dive to the murderer's rock. I'm just going to go through. Come on, baby. <coughs> there we go. All right, so you can swivel around and have a look at the exhibition. And looking close at everything, all of those circles are different places you can go to. I'll take you outside. All right, we should dive in Superman style soon. Here we go. So this is Murderer's Rock where the murders happened and our photographer trekked with four hours with all his camera gear and a special rig up here. I, didn't think, I don't think he thought it was gonna be quite so far. Um, and we've got special embedded content that we put in there about the places, specific places. And maps, views, and different ways to interact with that content. So that's available on a touch screen in the gallery. Right, I, if anyone wants to see a bit more of this, we can later, but I'll just crack on to what we learned from doing all of this. Okay. Okay, so why did we do this in the first place? We actually, as a museum, didn't set out initially to create all of this digital content. It was just 150 years to the um, year of the murders. Um, we were just going to do an exhibition. And actually, what ended up happening was staff themselves were really enthusiastic about the content and the story, and also a number of them were really quite digitally curious. Um, it's not our job, um, but we wanted to give it a go. Um, so we had an exhibition technician who's also a sculptor in his free time, and he really drove the 3D modeling side of it. Um, it was actually his son who ended up um, creating the final models. It was quite a fano affair. There's our ex-photographer who wanted to do um, the 360-degree panorama of Murderer's Rock. He self-taught himself um, what to do. 
And then there was me, the registrar, who um, was interested in doing tours, 360 degree tours of exhibitions with added content, because um, I'm interested in that on the side. Um, so we just did it. And um, that meant that some staff, like the graphic designer and the IT guy, just kind of got dragged along for the ride. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a strategic thing. It just happened. Um, things that were great about having keen staff was we put in stack loads of extra time. We were really, really enthusiastic, weekends and evenings. Um, we weren't provided at work with the tech we needed, the quality of tech, so staff often use their own tech at home. That was cool except when someone leaves and they've got the files on their computer and it's gone to another country. So just something to just be aware of. Um, and that the digital content gathering wasn't quite timetabled into the exhibition schedule, so we were sort of backtracking a bit. Things that 3D modeling we learned was um, you don't actually need as many photos as you thought. Each of those heads actually got 50 photos. That was all that was needed, and the, the backdrops have to be very, very clean. Um, any oddities or darkness in the backdrop confuses the software, and it takes a long time to unpick where the problem is. Um, from the taking tour photographs of the exhibition itself, um, I'd recommend that you timetable it in, or at least do it in part with the exhibition still not quite open to the public, where the cases aren't closed with perspex, where you can get in and get some nice vignette shots of things set up as they'll appear in the exhibition, and then do your tour of the exhibition itself once the exhibition's fully open. Um, we thought we could just throw in the existing label graphics up onto um, our 360 tour, but we had to do a bit of tutoing because things that look nice on a wall don't fit so well on a screen. So we had to do some cutting and pasting, which was just time we hadn't um, counted in. And you have to be very ordered and organized because when you're making these 360 degree tours, you're dealing with numerous spheres of spaces in different rooms that have to go in different directions. And if you're then adding content into those spheres, trying to explain that to someone else who is not familiar with the space or with the content um, is complicated. So it was just lucky that I was the middle in the go-between in this case, but I learned some really good lessons about just how to be very ordered and organized and name things very carefully. And that is the end. <laughs>